Thank you, Margaret. I appreciate that introduction. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, the previous panel was a, it's a difficult one to follow um, for a lot of reasons. But it, it, gives you, it gives me a great intro into what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about innovation in how we construct investment portfolios for clients. But before we start that, though, I do have uh, one advantage over that previous panel. Uh, I have a video. So we're going to roll the video that gives you a little bit of an insight into the Six Meridian Investment Team, and then I'm going to talk to you about um, the, the talk evidence-based investing. options today? Hmm, let's see. Huh. My reply is no. We'll try again tomorrow. What's your question? Alexa, what stock should we buy? Marijuana stocks are popular with millennials. All right, let's find some. Josh, are you ready to make our stock selections for the week? Sure, let's do it. Well, it looks like we're going to buy Monolithic Power and Monster Beverage. I don't think so. Well, obviously that's not what we do. Uh, but it was a lot of fun to make that video, thanks to Amanda, who is our producer, our director, and, uh, and videographer. What we are going to talk about is evidence-based investing. And so this morning when I was getting ready to leave, um, my nine-year-old said, what are you going to talk about today, Dad? And I said, well, I'm talking about evidence-based investing. And he said, does that mean there's a detective involved? And I said, no, there's not a detective involved. But there is some research that we do in order to try to determine how to best select uh, what we're going to buy on your behalf. So what is evidence-based investing? Um, what it is, is making investment decisions based on facts, based on information that we can discern, based on things that we can find by doing historical, uh, historical analysis, uh, looking at relationships that different uh, stocks have to different trends that are going on. And then what it's not is making our investment decisions based on emotion, based on guesswork, based on hunches or what we think. Here you see not evidence-based. We talk about buying Intel because 5G is going to be uh, going to be a big deal. 5G is a big technology that's going to impact cellular communications in a huge way, and, and Intel may or may not uh, benefit from that. That's not a reason why we would buy Intel. We would buy Intel because it's cheap relative to its earnings power. Uh, we heard on the previous panel about Amazon, what a great business it is, and how uh, impactful it is to our lives. We wouldn't buy Amazon just because it's a, a neat company that makes our lives easy, but we do look at it, and we do buy it because it is um, very profitable. Um, based on the amount of assets that it employs. And so that's one of the criteria that we've got. So before I get into the details of what we look for in stocks, I think it's helpful to look for or to look at a comparison to what are attributes that stocks possess. And then when we look at those attributes, how does that relate uh, to something that I think we can all understand? And it relates to the speaker earlier. And I'm going to talk about if you are sitting down and having a conversation with somebody about selecting a spouse or somebody who they were going to, to marry and spend their life with. And if you're having that conversation with them, you might start with saying you should look for somebody who's kind, look for somebody who's honest, trustworthy, agreeable, and interesting. Basically, somebody who you like and who you, have, who you can think you can spend your life with. Now, because you find that person, that doesn't mean that you're going to have a successful marriage. But let's look at it from the other direction. If you gave somebody advice and said you should look for somebody who's mean, who's not honest, who you can't stand being around, we all know that you're unlikely to have a successful marriage. So what we're looking for are attributes in stocks, similar to the way you look for attributes in people. 
In the stocks, we're looking for things like uh, stocks that have low business risk, stocks that are cheap on an earnings basis, stocks that have positive price momentum, that are high quality and have high dividend yields. And I'm going to talk more about each one of those um, here in just a minute. But that's the idea. As I talk throughout this, uh, this presentation about looking for the attributes in a stock, those are the types of attributes that we're looking for. Before I get into the in-depth, though, I have to take you all the way back to freshman finance. For any of you who took freshman finance, this will be a repeat. For those of you that didn't, in about one minute, I'm going to teach you everything that most people learn in their freshman finance course. And what we're focusing on is the CAPM, which is the Capital Asset Pricing Model. And this is a theory that came out in the early 1960s, and what it was, what it was put out to do was explain to investors what is the driver for why you make a return? And the, the theory that came out was that this line over here, which is beta, that is the amount of risk that you take as an investor. And so as you move out on that axis and you're taking more risk as an investor, your return should go up as well. This is your return. So that red line is called the security market line. And as we take on more risk, we should generate more return. And I think that everybody in this room would agree that makes perfect sense. It's extremely logical. I take risk, I'm going to make more return. And so this took the finance world, um, so to speak, by storm. And, and it became the, the core element of teaching to all finance students. But there was one problem with it, and it's a very big problem. The problem is that it's wrong. It doesn't work. Um, you don't get paid for taking on more risk. And so what this data shows, and this is a, a data from 1931 through 2009, but it was in 1972 that a guy named Fisher Black figured out, he went back and he tested this, and he said, okay, so if I take a collection of stocks and I group them based on their riskiness, and I say, okay, I'm gonna take the least risky stocks and then I'm gonna take it all the way out to the collection of the most risky stocks, what does that return profile look like? Is it a nice upward sloping line? Well, not, not only is it not an upward sloping line, it's not sloping at all. And in fact, it's got a downward slope here at the very end, the tail, which that means is as I take on more risk, I actually earn lower returns. And this is very puzzling because it doesn't fit with the narrative that we had from the 1960s. And it doesn't really fit with the narrative of what everybody in here probably thinks should be the case. So remember, this came out in 1972. That's an important date, and we'll come back to that in just a minute. When we first saw this data probably eight, nine, ten years ago, um, one question I had is, wow, I can't believe I didn't learn that in college or when I was taking the CFA or any time, any time else since it had been out there that long. But when we saw this, what we said is, well, we need to immediately look at and make sure that we don't have any of these outer most risky stocks in client portfolios because you're, getting, you're not getting paid to take that risk. In fact, it reduces your expected returns. That was the first thing. But then as you look at this chart longer, what you're going to figure out is that you actually want to own just the stocks on the far left. There's no reason to own any of the stocks to the right. And what, that's what we did. We built a portfolio called Low Beta, and it only owns the stocks that are out here in these, um, these furthest most left, uh, left hand part of the chart. And what that does is that creates a portfolio that generates the market return that we would all expect to get from the S&P 500 or whatever other benchmark you use, and we do it by eliminating a tremendous amount of risk. So that was very insightful. And what that did then is lead me and the team down the path of saying, what other things out there can we find, can we examine, can we research that help, that will improve the returns for the portfolios we manage for clients? In 1992, uh, this paper was written, it's written by a guy named Eugene Fama and uh, Ken French. Eugene Fama won a Nobel Prize for it, the other guy didn't, I'm not sure why that is. But this paper in 1992, 20 years after this first point came out about beta not being the full explanation for the returns that you generate as, a, as an investor, in 1992 this paper was published and it said there are three factors that will account for 90% of the return that you receive as an investor. So instead of there just being the one, which had always been thought to be beta, said there's three. And those three are the market beta, because you still do generate a good portion of your return as an investor is generated just because you're invested in the stock market. That's about 70% of the return that you generate. And then the other factors that can explain are market cap, uh, meaning small companies earned outsized returns compared to large companies, and then value. Value stocks, once trading at cheap earnings multiples, um, earn excess returns as well. 
So what this paper did in 1992 then is it started an arms race amongst academics, amongst professors to go out and say, okay, what other things exist? What other attributes are, are there out there that give us some indication in terms of what stocks are gonna outperform? And what you see here is we've highlighted, this is when that paper came out in 1992. And from the period of the mid-1960 to 1992, you only had 50 papers that were published that talked about investment attributes. From 1992 to 2018, there were another 300 papers. There was just an explosion of research around this topic, which was very helpful to everybody in this room because what we want is we want people digging in and trying to find the little, the little things that are in place that can help tilt the, the outcomes in our favor. But with that many papers published, that creates a very large workload. That creates a large workload for me, for Will, the rest of the investment team. And we had a lot of papers and a lot of days reading things like this, which have completely unintelligible math equations associated with them. And this was gonna be a long process to go through and try to figure this out, but we got some help. Uh, about three years ago, two professors, and I'm sure a number of graduate assistants, went down the path of saying, we're gonna go back and re-examine every single one of these attributes that have been published. And when these are published, these are in the most respected journals out there. And so they went through and they looked at each one of these publications and they said, how many of these factors, after the fact of being published, still make sense? They still work, they still generate excess returns. And what they found is a, a, a high percentage of them didn't work. After they got published, people figured it out, they started trading on it, and that, that factor went away. But be the benefit for us is that there was a very small subset that did work, and actually this graph didn't translate, but this small blue is the amount of factors that actually did work that we can still use and that we can still uh, work with. And so out of those, that smaller subset of those 350, we are able to create the portfolios that we manage for all of our clients. And so here's the, the, the graphic or the data on the returns generated from the five factors that we focus on internally, which are these five right down here. And what we, sh we show on the screen is the return for the S&P 500 over the 30 year period of time, and then what the returns have been for each of the five factors over that same 30 year period of time. And what you see, and this isn't risk adjusted, so this is just the gro gross returns that you get. So in any one of those factors, if you would have owned it for 30 years, you would have ended up making more money than if you would have just owned the S&P 500. As you spend a minute looking at this, though, I think most of you are going to look to it and, and immediately say, well, that's interesting, Andrew, but why would I bother owning low beta or even momentum? Why don't I just own quality and value? They're 3% 3, 3 per year better than owning the S&P 500. It's a dramatic increase over 30 years, compounding at 3% higher is a dramatic increase in your overall wealth. So why don't I just focus on owning those two? Um, there are two reasons why um, you aren't going to just own uh, those two. Uh, the primary reason is um, tracking error, and the secondary reason is because we're all humans. So we'll talk about tracking. Tracking error is the measure of how much your return deviates from the index return. So I'm going to give you an example. If you look at an institutional portfolio, most of those portfolios will have a tracking error of 1%. And what that means is if the S&P 500 was up 10%, that portfolio will be up between 9 and 11 percent, two-thirds of the time. It's a very tight tracking error, and it's a way to make sure you don't get fired. When you look at these attributes, um, quality, value, yield, the tracking error for those attributes are 10 percent. Recipe to make sure you do get fired. So what a 10 percent tracking error does is it means that if the market's up 10 percent, my portfolio is up anywhere from 0 to 20. And for most people in this room, you'll say, well, from 10 to 20 is great, but unfortunately, it's uh, just as likely that it could be from 0 to 10 as it is from 10 to 20. And so when you have that degree of tracking error, if you, are, if you want to look at your portfolio on any regular basis, you're probably going to become very frustrated at some point in time because that tracking error is going to lead to massive underperformance um, while you're managing that portfolio. But if you're willing to only look at your portfolio once every 10 years, then I would say you should own quality and value because over that one to every 10 year period of time when you look at it, your returns probably are going to look pretty strong and you're going to outperform. So the reason that you, as a human, the reason that we can't stick with those portfolios that have the high tracking error is because in here, most of you in here are going to say, you know what, I'm a long-term investor, I can withstand that volatility. Well, the problem is, is this guy um, famously said during the Great Depression when people were talking about solutions to try to get us out of the Great Depression, which would, would have worked, 
over the long term is in the long term we're all dead and most of us aren't willing to wait 30 years to be to demonstrate that what we're doing is going to work um, three years five years maybe but certainly not 30 years here's a, a graphic that uh, just shows us the the impact of how long this um, underperformance can last and if you look at this data this goes back it's a little bit different different data set than what we had before because this goes back to 1928 I think um, and this looks at value so value still is outperforming by 3% per year but what you see over here is a chart this is the number of months and then this is the percentage of underperformance for that strategy and there's been three different times since 1928 where value has underperformed by anywhere from 20 to 30 percent over a period of time that lasted anywhere from four to seven or eight years and none of us have the, the stamina to stick with a strategy that's underperformed for seven straight years. Um, and as a result, you have a problem if you only own one of those factors, even though it gives you better outcomes, or even if you only own two of those factors. So the question is for the rooms, well, how do we solve for that? Because I want that outperformance, and I want that, result, I want that benefit. And the way that we solve for that is you ask Will to build you a correlation matrix of the factors. And when he does that, you see that these factors have high correlation, which is very important, high correlation to the S&P 500. So this just shows each of the factors and then its correlation to the S&P 500. When you're an investor, you want positive correlation to the S&P 500 because the S&P 500 most of the time goes up and correlation means I go up as well. So we want to be correlated positively with that fact, with the market as a whole. But what we also want is we don't want them to all be correlated highly to each other. So what that means is we need things to zig when other things zag. So when low beta is doing well, momentum maybe isn't doing as well. Maybe it's in that one of those periods where it's underperforming. Or when momentum is doing well, maybe yield is, isn't doing as well. So we, if each of those factors have low correlation to each other, then you smooth out those rough edges and you take your tracking error down significantly. And it's still pretty high for the strategies we manage. Our tracking error probably runs anywhere from 4 to 5 percent, which is pretty high, but it's significantly lower than, than, uh, than 10 percent. And I'm going to show you in a minute that with a 5 percent tracking error, we only have to really look out to about five years to demonstrate that most of the time we're going to outperform. And this is what happens when you put the factors together. This isn't exactly the way that we manage the portfolio um, in-house. We actually have a couple of other uh, screens that we put on top of it to take some additional risk out of it. But what you see is a massive gap in wealth creation created if you own these factors that outperform over time. And this is, what, like I said, 30 years worth of data. But we don't want to wait 30 years to see that benefit uh, manifest. We need it to happen sooner than that. I know this chart looks awful, and it, uh, and it is, but I'm going to make it better. Um, what we've got here is one, three, and five year rolling returns. Rolling returns mean because this is a mechanical process, we can build our portfolio every month and then have a look at how it did. So we can build a portfolio on January 1st, then we can build another portfolio on fe February 1, another one, et cetera. And then we can look out, okay, from Jan 1 to the next year, how well did that portfolio do? From Feb 1, how did, well did that portfolio? So those are rolling one-year returns. When we build those rolling one-year returns, um, it allows us then to look at how likely are we in any given year to underperform or outperform. And then we can roll it forward, say, in a three-year and a five-year. And what you see is on a one-year basis, because we do have that high tracking error, about a third of the time the strategy will underperform the, the benchmark index. But when you move out on the time, so it's a third of the time you underperform, but as you move out and you get to the five-year period, the percentage of time that you underperform starts to decrease dramatically. It gets down to less than, than 10%. When you look at the 7%, the, the black line that you see in this chart is what the return was from the market, and then the red dots are the returns from each of the portfolio iterations that we were running. And so what you see is when you're underperforming, it's very far out here on the end of the scale where you're very slightly underperforming even though the market's making a lot of money. But then you look in the periods of time like here where the market's up 1%, 2%, and you see massive outperformance. And that's where you see that compounded benefit over time of why your terminal wealth ends up being so much larger. Because when the market is doing very mo modest or very minor returns, your portfolio might be compounding five, six, seven percent. And so that's why when internally, when we look at uh, Six Marine and what we're doing, we're constantly trying to evaluate how are we building, how are we looking at these different factors. And we're, we're always looking for new ones to add. 
um, and if there's a reason to take them out also. So we do a lot of testing on a monthly basis to make sure that the efficacy is still there, that these factors are still delivering the returns that we expect. But that's the type of research that we're doing, and this applies not just to, to the mega cap portfolio or the low beta, but it really applies across the entire spectrum of the portfolios that we manage um, for six marine clients. And then I've only got two more slides to go. Um, do I have a market forecast? I get this question a lot. In fact, I got it before we started uh, this morning from somebody. And uh, the question is, I don't know how many of you were here for our presentation last year, but for those of you who were, this will make sense. Um, last year, we talked a lot about George Costanza and the mistakes that he probably would make as an investor. And do we have a market forecast? We don't. As we talked about last year, we have no idea um, what the market's going to do. We have no idea when or, or why. But what I can tell you is I'll give you a little update about where we are today and where we were a year ago. Because I think it's instructive and it's gonna, it might help as you're thinking about investment expectations. A year ago, August, when we were here for this last uh, uh, conference, the S&P 500 was at 2902. Today it's at, I don't know if I'm reading that right, 2926. Um, it's basically flat in the last 12 months. Global equities are down since last year. U.S. small caps are down 15% compared to where they were last year. And the reason for that is the earnings picture for companies deteriorated pretty significantly between last year and when we had this conference and t today. And then the multiple that the investors were willing to assign to that also deteriorated. Uh, if you look at commodity prices, they basically are flat to slightly down. Oil's down quite a bit, but copper prices are basically flat compared to where they were. And then the big change over the last 12 months, as Eaton Vance talked about this morning, are fixed income and interest rates. And so if you look at the 10-year interest rate right now, it's basically been cut in half compared to where we were a year ago. What, how I interpret that is the market is telling us that the future growth profile for the U.S. economy is not very strong and that the inflation outlook is very benign. There's not a lot of inflation uh, coming our way. And so with modest growth expectations and then probably with modest inflation expectations at the same time, the question is, how do we compare from an economic standpoint today to where we were a year ago? And, and the reason I say that is, do we think that the forward outlook for the economy would give, lead us to believe that the return profile for equity should be better, the same, or worse than it was a year ago? And if you look at the economic data, there's just, the top three, I think, are the most interesting for us. Um, unemployment is down slightly. Um, these are the big three that we track internally in terms of the state of the economy. So unemployment is strong. Um, or the employment rate is very strong, unemployment rate is very low. So I'd say that's a strong green light for us right now. But the question is, can it go much lower? Um, you heard the previous panels talk about the number of unfilled jobs, and it's very difficult for that unemployment rate to get a lot lower than it is now. So that's probably difficult to see how that gets much better over the next year. The next one is the leading economic indicators of year-over-year -year growth. And so this is a collection of different indicators that say how good it does the future look? And a year ago, that number was 6% um, year-over-year year growth. This year, it's at 1.6. So I would put that solidly in a yellow category. It's not flashing warnings that we're about to go into recession, but it certainly is telling you that things are slowing down and that we need to be a little bit aware of, of, of what's going on with the economy. And the leading economic indicator at 1.6, I think it's very consistent with what you've seen with the, fixed in, uh, the, the interest rate uh, decline that we've seen since that period of time. And then the next one, which is probably one of the better indicators available, it's called the Chicago Fed National Activity Index. And it has a tremendous track record of predicting when the economy is about to go into a recession. A negative number doesn't mean a bad thing. So this index, index fluctuates between negative 0.3 and positive 0.3. Where it's really bad is when it's at a negative 0.7. That almost always means that you're about to enter into a recession. But what I will tell you is a negative number means that things are slower than they were a year ago. And then the last point is manufacturing. We heard that from somebody earlier, that manufacturing clearly has slowed. And manufacturing is only about 10% of the economy these days, but it has clearly slowed. So my more market, for, I don't have a market forecast, but what I have is an observation that a year ago, the, the indicators that you would track had some pretty favorable readings to them. And in the subsequent 12 months, you didn't make any money as an equity investor made a lot of money as a fixed income investor. The forward 12 month numbers probably aren't quite as positive as they are today, 
But we've had a reset in certain parts of pockets of the market. If you look at what's happened to international emerging market equities and U.S. small cap equities, you've already had a pretty significant price reset that's taken place. And so those, those would be areas that if you do get any positive surprise or any positive pickup, those probably react uh, more positively than, uh, than maybe just the generic U.S. equities. Thank you.